In Germany, Interpol detective Louis watches his partner Thomas meet with a mysterious informant that promises to have juicy information on the IBBC, the International Bank of Business and Credit. He still needs time to sort things though, so Thomas makes him swear he'll bring actual physical proof of his intel for their next meeting before he leaves. On his way out, he calls assistant district attorney Eleanor to tell him the little information he knows, and when's about to cross the street, he suddenly grabs his arm, throws up, and falls unconscious to the ground. As soon as Louis notices this, he runs toward Thomas to check on him, but he ends up being hit by a car and falls unconscious as well. Louis wakes up later at the hospital in good health, but Thomas is dead. When he identifies the body at the morgue, the doctor explains it was a heart attack, but Louis doesn't believe it and double checks the body. This allows him to fight a tiny syringe scar on Thomas' neck, thus Louis asks to call the police for a proper autopsy since this smells like murder. Meanwhile in the district attorney's office in New York, Eleanor is trying to convince his co-workers that this contact Thomas made may be the breakthrough they needed, but she's met with skepticism because if the investigation continues, it'll probably crash against the red tape. Their conversation is interrupted by a call from Louis, informing them of Thomas' death, so Eleanor has to fly to Berlin immediately. Sometime later, Eleanor and Louis are meeting with the federal police. They explain there are indicators pointing at hydrocyanic poisoning, but the police think is circumstantial evidence and point out that the tests were negative for poisons, therefore they can't see a reason why they should believe this could be murder. Eleanor and Louis have no choice but to confess that they've been investigating the IBBC for two years since they received correlated intelligence indicating that this bank has become the choice for things like money laundering, terrorism, and arms trading. The informant Thomas met, who they still don't know the identity of, may have also died or disappeared because they haven't been able to contact him for 12 hours. The cops aren't happy they weren't told about any of this before and explain that without better evidence than random theories, pursuing the IBBC won't happen in Germany. They also remind Louis to be careful with his actions because of his history. On their way back to the hotel, Eleanor wants to know what Louis did in the past for a warning like that, but Louis refuses to explain. Meanwhile in a museum in Berlin, IBBC executive Wexler meets with the consultant to bring some big news, Italian prime ministerial candidate and arms manufacturer Calvini has cancelled his deal with the bank, so the consultant must take care of him. Sometime later, Louis is checking the news and discovers that IBBC's senior vice president of acquisitions Clement has died in a mysterious road accident. The next morning in the Interpol headquarters in France, Louis' superior Victor finds him early in the office surrounded by research. Louis is sure Clement was Thomas' informant and he was killed for snitching because the times on gendarmerie's accident report don't match the statement given by Jonas, the IBBC chairman. Louis wants to go to Luxembourg to talk to Jonas and catch him with a lie, but Victor refuses, reminding Louis he isn't a cop anymore. Louis changes his mind by pointing out how the IBBC is constantly being blocked by the complexities of international law and gets to travel to the IBBC offices, where he sees Jonas with Wexler yet gets ignored by them. Instead, Louis is received by White, the bank's legal counsel, and the commissioner of the gendarmerie. Louis is angry that he can't meet with Jonas as he was promised, but he explains the reason for his visit anyway, pointing out the difference in times between the report and Jonas' statement. The commissioner grabs the report and immediately tells him it was simply a typing mistake from his employees. Louis has no choice but to leave without a fight, and on his way out, he gets a call from Eleanor telling him that the full tox analysis they ran on Thomas' body is inconclusive, the levels of cyanide in his blood aren't high enough to count as poisoning. This leaves Louis so paranoid that when someone accidentally bumps into him, he turns around and grabs the person rather violently thinking they were trying to poison him as well. But it was just a random client of the bank. Later in the evening, Eleanor keeps calling Clement's wife to see if she knows anything. The poor woman doesn't want to be bothered anymore, but Eleanor points out her husband was probably killed and wasn't in an accident, so she gives her a phone number in case she remembers anything. Seconds later, Eleanor receives a message from Clement's wife saying she had no idea her husband was meeting with Interpol, but when it comes to the matter of illegal weapons, he was in contact with Calvini. Meanwhile Louis shows up at Victor's house to tell him how the bank paid off the gendarmerie to change the report. Victor wants Louis to come inside, but Louis grabs Victor's phone and destroys it, finding a hidden bug inside. Victor agrees to walk his dog to have a cover while they talk outside, and Louis explains he found bugs in his place too, same for Eleanor. Victor wants to alert their superiors about this but Louis stops him, explaining that if they set off alarms they'll lose the opportunity to catch these guys in secret. Louis shows him a picture of Clement standing with Calvini and explains what Eleanor has found out so far, thus Victor gives him permission to travel to Milan. In the meantime, a mysterious sniper is shooting a special bullet that he puts in a box and sends to Italy, where it is picked up by police captain Barillo. A few days later, Louis and Eleanor arrive in Milan and meet Inspector Cerruti, who is in charge of overseeing Calvini's latest political rally. While waiting to be received, Eleanor points out she can tell Louis isn't eating or sleeping well and reminds him to take better care of himself because she can't have him crashing like he did two years ago. Eleanor knows this because she finally called the yard and discovered Louis left after he tried to investigate the IBBC there. His witness had been a joke, the case fell apart, 
and an angry Louis snapped and attacked an assistant commissioner. Louis points out the official version isn't true, his witness had been solid, but suddenly his AC forced him to cut him loose and three days later, the witness and his family all died in a car crash. When Louis and Eleanor finally get to meet Calvany, they're reminded that this conversation is all off the record. Calvany explains that Jonas is trying to make the IBBC the exclusive broker of Chinese small arms to the third world, and the missile deal they were trying to get out of Calvany is the gateway transaction. Louis isn't sure how much profit the bank is getting out of this, so Calvany has to explain this isn't about profit, it's about control. They don't want to control the conflict, they want to control the debt the conflict creates. That's the essence of the banking industry, you control the debt, you control everything, including the nations themselves. During the rally, a young sniper hides in a hotel across the street and when his stopwatch hits one minute, he shoots at Calvany, but the shot fails. A second shot comes and does kill Calvany, but this bullet didn't come from the same man. As the crowd begins panicking, Louis and Eleanor come out from a cafe to see what's going on, and Barillo takes his men inside the hotel, already knowing where the sniper is and pretending he saw him on the window. The cops find the sniper trying to escape and shoot him on the spot, then Barillo plants the bullet he received in the mail to make it look like this guy truly killed Calvany. Louis notices the cops entering the hotel and goes inside as well, finding the consultant escaping through the back door, thus he follows him to the streets with Eleanor and Charuti closely behind him. Once outside, they can't see the consultant anywhere, but Eleanor approaches a car with someone inside. This is indeed the consultant, who hits her with the car before driving away. Eleanor is fine but she can barely move, so Saruti accepts to stay with her and gives his gun to Louis to go after the criminal. Louis runs after the car and catches it when it stops at a red light, but by the time he comes closer, the consultant had already abandoned the vehicle. Meanwhile Jonas is trying to negotiate another weapon sale with a general working for the RFF when the secretary interrupts him because he's needed somewhere else. White and Wexler inform Jonas of Calvany's death and comment they should wait until the authorities resolve the matter to approach Calvany's sons about the missile's deal, but Jonas disagrees. He doesn't want to risk any complications with the sale, meaning they should approach the sons now since they would have jumped on the deal anyway if it hadn't been for their father. In the evening, Trudy tells Eleanor and Louis about the clues he's found so far. The dead sniper had been a member of the Red Brigade, and the guy they followed drove a stolen car. They were unable to find lift prints, fibers, or residue, and nobody saw him leave either so the official story is blaming the Red Brigade for the kill. Louis doesn't believe it and thinks the man had been set up, thus he convinces Charuti to let him and Eleanor look around the scene of the crime. Using two flag sticks on the bullet holes left on a column, they follow the direction the bullets come from, then Louis looks through the holes to notice one came from the room where they found and killed the sniper, but the other came from the hotel's roof. Louis and Eleanor go to the roof and find plenty of space for a sniper to hide. Since the dead sniper had a stopwatch with him, Louis thinks it could have synchronized, but Eleanor points out a problem. Two bullet casings had been found in the room and ballistics confirmed they matched the weapon, so there's no way to explain where the second bullet came from or where the third is. Louis isn't sure what to do until he finds a puddle, and he brings a special team to remove the water with a special machine, finding a footprint that looks extremely familiar. When they return to the office, Louis shows Eleanor and Charuti that he has a picture of the same footprint from the crime scene where a former IMF executive director was killed last year. Charuti sends the footprints to the lab and confirms there's a high possibility of a match, they also learn that the reason why they have such a particular tread pattern is that it belongs to a custom shoe made for a metal leg brace. Louis asks for these clues to be sent to the FBI to confirm the match, but before they can go any further, Barillo shows up and informs them that Louis and Eleanor must leave the country because this is his investigation. Unfortunately there's nothing Charuti can do to help because Barillo had authorization from their Interpol superiors. Later at the airport, Eleanor sees the metal detector and realizes that if the second sniper left the country, the security camera should have caught him removing the metal leg brace to pass the inspection. Charuti uses his police power to talk to the airport guards and gets them access to the recordings, but the consultant is hard to see because he knows where the cameras are and he always keeps his face turned away. An airport employee checks the flight logs and confirms this guy left the country and is already in New York. Louis and Eleanor travel to New York too, where a captain from the NYPD assigns detectives Ward and Ornelas to help them. They have some clip shots of the consultant moving through customs, finally allowing them to see his face, and the ID he used is attached to a dead address. They think he lives in the city though, because a guy from FBL Impressions called and confirmed the footprints match, that brace tread pattern is exclusive to shoes produced here in New York and they have the name of the doctor that sells them. While Eleanor returns to the office to calm down her superior who thinks she's playing with fire, Louis and the detectives visit Dr. Isaacson, who only accepts to help when Louis tells him there's a patient of his that has killed multiple doctors and he may be next. Isaacson agrees to give them access to his files, but he doesn't recognize the consultant when he's shown a picture. Meanwhile Jonas gets a call from Wexler and the others, who warn him about Louis and Eleanor being on the right trail. Jonas doesn't want to pause the negotiations with the Calvany brothers, so he agrees getting rid of the consultant is their best choice to get the Interpol off their backs. After working all night, Ward finds a file belonging to some Gabriel Hansen, 
who Isakson doesn't recognize because he was a patient handled by his associate. This file is very suspicious because the address is a P.O. box, he always paid cash, there are no diagnostic pictures, and the phone number belongs to a deadline. There are also the letters GT written next to each visit log, and Isaacson explains it means they called a go taxi for the guy because they had a kickback account with the company. They send all these leads to the police station and get an address in return, on their way to check it out, Louis calls Eleanor to tell her about the lead. Eleanor asks him to hurry because her superior has threatened with closing the case soon if they don't find anything. When Louis and the detectives make it to the address where the cabs left the consultant after every doctor appointment, they find an empty lot. While they decide where to go next, Ornelas crosses the street to get breakfast and sees the consultant passing by. He immediately tells his partners and they start following him through the streets, noticing how the consultant stops at a public phone to pick up a message with a location for his next meeting, which happens to be the Guggenheim Museum. The trio finds the consultant seated next to Wexler, who Louis recognizes from his visit to the IBBC, but they can't hear what they're talking about. The consultant thinks he'll be eliminated soon, but Wexler gives him instructions to kill Louis. Once their little meeting is over, Ornelas follows Wexler on his way out, and Louis and Ward keep an eye on the consultant. Unfortunately, a museum decoration gives away their presence in its reflection and the duo is forced to come out to make the arrest now. The consultant warns them they won't allow them to take him away, and just as he predicts, suddenly a group of thugs from the IBBC shows up and shoots both the consultant and Ward. The detective dies on the spot, but the consultant is wearing a bulletproof vest and survives. The thugs continue to fire at them and Louis fires back, killing a couple of men while making his way back to the consultant, who is also shooting back and offers Louis to work together if they want to survive. Louis accepts, and after helping him get rid of the vest so he can breathe again, the two of them hide in a corridor, where Louis ear gets grazed by a bullet. They create a distraction by pushing a wheelchair out, giving them the chance to run back out and shoot another bunch of thugs. The men just keep coming, and the consultant this time is hit for good. Thus Louis shoots at the chandelier to make it fall on top of the thugs, gaining an opening to escape with the consultant before the cops arrive. Sadly the consultant dies before he can offer any information. In the evening, Eleanor pulls some strings to rescue Louis from the police station, she also brings a special intelligence report on Wexler. After dodging some cars that try to stop them from leaving, Eleanor takes Louis to Ornella station, where he's keeping Wexler locked in an office. Louis has a talk with him, revealing he knows Wexler used to fight for communist values, but Wexler explains he got caught in the corrupt webs of the system. He also thinks Louis' idea of justice is an illusion because the IBBC has contacts everywhere, so trying to bring them to justice is pointless, they'll just pay off cops and judges. The only way to truly stop them is to work outside the law. Understanding Wexler also wants revenge, Louis tells Eleanor to walk away from the case before they get to her too. He'll take care of these criminals from the shadows, and he wants Eleanor to tell everyone he escaped from custody, which will be easily believed thanks to his history. Later in Italy, the Calvini brothers cancel their meeting with the IBBC after Louis lets them know the bank killed their father. White and his team are kicked out of the Calvini offices, and White calls Jonas to let him know what happened, but he never makes it back to the city. The police can't find the car or the driver, so they assume the Calvini brothers are sending them a message. Wexler points out that they could sell their old defective missiles to Sunai, the man selling to the Israeli government, and keep him silent with a good amount of money. Jonas authorizes the plan and Wexler arranges the meeting with Sunai before calling Louis to let him know the details. The next day in a cemetery in Istanbul, while Jonas waits for Sunai, Wexler pretends to need the bathroom and meets with Louis in secret to give him a tape recorder with a radio connected to a hidden bug Wexler put on Jonas' jacket. Louis needs to record the part where Jonas tells Sunai about the defective missiles, then they can share it with all the IBBC's clients so they know they're a fraud. This will make everyone cancel their orders and the bank will collapse. Once Sunai arrives, Jonas asks him to visit the catacombs with him to speak in private. Louis has been watching them from a safe distance, but when the men go down into the tunnels, the signal begins failing, so Louis has to follow them while Wexler waits outside and is approached by a mysterious person. In the tunnels, Louis manages to hide behind columns for a while and hears the men discussing the delivery of the weapons. However before they even start to touch the subject of the defective missiles, Louis bumps into a bunch of bats that alerts the guards of his presence, and he gets kicked out without getting to record the most important part. By the time Jonas and Sinai come out, they've already finished their meeting and are going on their separate ways. Jonas approaches Wexler only to find him dead, so instead of leaving in his car, he decides to go to the streets and hide in the crowd. Louis approaches Wexler as well and after taking the gun he had hidden in his clothes, he goes after Jonas, who sees Louis coming and tries to escape by running on the roofs. When Jonas gets caught on a dead end, he tells Louis that killing him is pointless because someone else will take his position and the IBBC will keep going, which makes Louis hesitate. At that moment, a hitman hired by the Calvini brothers shows up and kills Jonas, thanking Louis for making his job easier. Louis is left stunned, not knowing what to do now that his investigation led to nothing. Just as Jonas predicted, later on someone else takes over his position and the IBBC continues to grow. 
However their aggressive tactics and unbelievable growth become too suspicious even for the government, so the American Senate finally allows Eleanor to go all out with a full investigation.